And so we'll be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 7. And the title of the message is The Sacrifice of Fools. And so let us give attention as we hear from God's Word, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 7. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, busyness. And a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice, and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. But fear thou God. In the preacher's writing, in Solomon's writing, he's been giving these overviews of life. He's been talking about life under the sun. For, for these chapters, he's been talking about the wise and the foolish. And he's spoken about how there is a benefit in being wise, yet it doesn't always seem like there's a great benefit in being wise, since the wise and the foolish, they both, they both go down to the grave. But nevertheless, the preacher, Solomon, will show why it is better to be wise and why it is better to fear God. And he'll do it here in chapter 5. Uh, here, Solomon draws our attention to something a little different than what he's been speaking of before. He brings us out from, from this talk of things under the sun, and he brings us to the house of God. The house of God, not something that is under the sun, something that is pure vanity like everything else upon the earth. He takes us to the house of God. Now, there are only just a handful of places in the book of Ecclesiastes in which Solomon gives us this, this view, this explicit kind of counsel about heavenly things. Most of Ecclesiastes is dealing with things under the sun. But here in chapter 5, this is one of them, when he says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And he says, Be ready to hear. Be more ready to hear. And don't give the sacrifice of fools. And he says, Pay your vow that you make before God. Now Solomon brings us to the house of God, and has us envision the fool, the fool who is rash in these things. And so he's, he's applying some of the things he said already about the fool and bringing it to the context of the house of God. And how will it go for the fool who is rash, who is hasty, who doesn't consider that they do evil when they go to the house of God? Now Solomon would have us consider the fool who approaches God without proper humility. And much of his language is, is getting at that point. And so this will be the subject of our study this evening in Ecclesiastes 5. And with the Lord's help, we will undertake to study some of these admonitions. The admonitions that Solomon is, is giving us, and we'll do this through a number of biblical examples of those who have been foolish in these things and those who have been wise in these things. And so the three main admonitions that we will consider this evening are all found in the first verse of this chapter. So the first is keeping your foot when going to the house of God. The second is being more ready to hear than to speak. And then the third is not to speak hastily, rashly, and give the sacrifice of fools. Now these admonitions, they're all found right here in the first verse. And they're all expanded upon in the following verses. But the main overriding point here is, is very simple. Solomon saying, consider the fool and take great care when going before the Lord. 
Take great care when going before the Lord. We are not dealing with a man when we go before the Lord. We are not dealing with an earthly king when we go before the Lord. God is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Psalm 89, verse 7. And so this is how we are to think. This is how we are to understand when we are coming before God in our various times of worship. And the fool is the one that doesn't get the memo. The fool is the one that doesn't think that they're doing evil. And they make excuses for themselves over and over. And the fool is someone who's characterized in numerous parts of God's word as someone who's morally bankrupt. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're making excuses for themselves because they say that they're right in their own eyes, such that they do not understand that they are heaping judgment upon themselves. They do not understand that they are inserting themselves into a snare and that the trap is going to close on them. And when it does, they, they will be surprised. This is the fool. They'll be caught totally off guard when the trap is sprung. And so this should be of great weight to us as we think of these things, especially as we are going, uh, as Solomon is bringing us to consider going to the house of God. Uh, Solomon's admonitions to us, therefore our safety, therefore our instruction, if we're able to receive them by God's grace. But these are not easy words for us to hear. They're not easy. This is challenging for us. It's challenging to preach. Yet this is the counsel of God. And so with the Lord's help, we will uh, press ahead with these admonitions and we will be challenged by them if the Lord uh, would, would be so merciful to us. And so first, the first admonition, keeping your foot when going to the house of God. So when we hear this admonition right here from verse one, on one level, it's quite easy for us to understand what it means almost intuitively, since it's not that that strange of an expression for us. We do have expressions like this. We use them quite often. Uh, children, so what does it mean when you've been misbehaving in some way and someone would say to you, you had better watch your step? So what does that mean? Does it mean that you, you need to look down at your feet and make sure that you only step in the right places? Or are they talking about something more general, something more comprehensive when they say, you had better watch your step. Of course, it's, it's a blanket statement. It means many things. It covers a whole range of things. The person is, is essentially telling you, you had better weigh every one of your actions and every one of your words. You'd better weigh them carefully. You'd better watch your step. And so this is what the preacher, the inspired preacher, is getting at when he says, keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God. It's also a way of saying, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Because of acknowledgement of who you are as a sinner, that you would weigh your every word, weigh your every action, remember that you are made of the dust, and that it would be quite simple for you to do something unwise as you go before the house as you go before God and the house of God and so this same this same concept it's at work in numerous passages in scripture we could we could think back to Exodus 3 5 Moses coming into the presence of God when the Lord says uh, draw not nigh hither put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground the Lord having Moses pause, reflect, remember, and then do this action of preparation, an action really of, of humility. Uh, Joshua sort of, Joshua experienced the same thing when he was met by Christ. Uh, Joshua 5.15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, it's not that the ground itself was, was holy itself, but it's that the Lord was, was especially present in that place. It made it uh, fitting that Moses and that Joshua should pause, should consider, and should do this, this act of humility and remembering uh, their own frailty, uh, rec recognizing their own sinfulness and their need for preparation for uh, uh, for humility 
and coming before the presence of God. And so you see some of the parallels here. You see some of the parallels. Uh, we also can see this same sort of concept elaborated a little bit more when the Lord gives Moses these instructions, the instructions for the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. So note the Lord's instructions here in Exodus 30. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Exodus 30. And so we see in that the same sort of concept is expanded there. You have Aaron and his sons. And all of these priests who come to the tabernacle to do this weighty and solemn thing to offer and to burn sacrifices to the Lord. And they weren't to just walk straight up to it, but they were to stop. They were to pause. And as they go through this process of, of washing their hands and their feet in this laver, they are to pause and to consider. It's an act of humility. And the Lord puts great importance upon it. By saying that they must do this, that they die not. It's not a small matter. So if it's not a small matter for them, it should not be a small matter for us. Now, of course, there's, there's a spiritual parallel to this. It's all, there's a spiritual fulfillment to this. Uh, we're not to think that we of ourselves may clean ourselves and wash ourselves in such a way that we could do anything to present ourselves as as righteous or as worthy of, of coming into God's present uh, presence. Of course, there's a spiritual connection here. Uh, that's the message behind the sacrificial system and the system of washings. The message is the reality of Christ making his people clean, uh, Christ washing his people spiritually, the reality of, of God stooping so low to show his mercies, to his to sinners that they might have access that they might come through Christ but still even more so because of that we're still uh, sinners and so even more so we have this this obligation in light of everything that God has done to pause to stop to consider and to prepare and to prepare to come with gravity to these ordinances. Remember when Christ told Peter this, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. There's, there's this continual need that we have to pause, to stop, to consider. And so this is what is coming to us through the voice of the preacher through Ecclesiastes 5. It's also picked up in the New Testament. We've, we've said a few, we've given a few examples from the Old Testament, but it's also picked up in the New Testament in a different sort of way. It's not a, so much about the, the rituals. It's not about the, the washing with water and the sacrificial system, but no, it's, it's about more spiritual things. We can hear it in the words of, of Paul and of Peter. If we looked at Ephesians 4 from Paul, he says, put off concerning the former conversation. The old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. So Paul saying, stop, pause, put off the former conversation, the old man. Paul also saying, Colossians 3, 9, he says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And then we see it quite clearly here from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Wherefore? Laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so Peter 
uh, making connection to the Lord's redemption, the Lord's work of, of salvation in his people, if so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and saying, in light of that, because of that, stop, consider, put off that which is unclean, which is filthy, put it off and come circumspectly. All of these things are in keeping with the admonition we have from Solomon. Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God, because it all involves walking carefully, putting off whatever would hinder us so that we could enjoy uh, fellowship with Christ unhindered by these things. If we have come, if we have repented, if we have prepared, we may enjoy this rich fellowship with Christ. Before we move to the next admonition, let's consider a figure from the word of God that did not heed this counsel from the preacher. So let's consider a fool, someone who did not consider this, someone who is rash from Second, uh, Second Chronicles 26. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with all. And his name spread far abroad for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction for he transgressed against the Lord, his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men, and they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God." Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house being a leper for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house judging the people of the land. And so there's very much we could all we could glean from here. But the main uh, the main thrust here is simple. Don't be foolish. Don't be presumptuous and, and hurry in to do these things which are not right to do. Uh, don't presume upon God's mercy, especially when dealing with things pertaining to the worship of the Lord, especially when engaged in these spiritual exercises. Instead, heed what is written here, be circumspect. Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God. Someone who is keeping their foot so to speak, is someone who is very aware in their mind of what they are doing. Like someone who is trying to cross over a bridge that's made of ice. Every, pl every place they put their foot, they're going to be very attentive to what's going on. This is the right frame of mind in coming to worship the Lord. God is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all that are about him. Psalm 89. Well, there's far more we could say about this, but the need for prep uh, and the need for preparation before we come to the house of God. But let us move to the next admonition, the next admonition from our text, which is be more ready to hear. Solomon's admonitions continue. He says, be more ready to hear. Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven. And thou upon earth, therefore, let thy words be few. So this admonition is for us to guard our mouths, guard our words as we come to the Lord. And so this could be referring to uh, several things. It could be referring to prayers that we offer before the Lord, 
or it could be referring to vows or oaths that are made in worship settings. Now, these things, Solomon is saying, these things should not be filled with idle words or uh, vain words or words that are just there for the sake of lengthening speech that someone might have something, uh, something eloqu eloquent to say. So, in, and we'll see here that this, this is an admonition specifically uh, about, about making, there, there's also an admonition about making vows. But what we're seeing here, first of all, is that this is an admonition against wordiness, against wordiness when coming before God. Now, of course, we would want to be much in prayer. We would want to be always in prayer. And, and we would want to pray about all manner of things. But there is also a caution against wordiness and against vain repetitions. We have this even from the Lord Christ when he says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And so we're told, be cautious about what comes out of your mouth. It might not be a good idea to just have your tongue uh, going freely in these things, because you may be uh, resorting to vain and idle speech. Uh, the, the preacher in Ecclesiastes continues on in verse 3. He says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. And so what we're seeing here is that there is a way to be, there is a way to be tedious even in prayer, for using so many words and in multiplying expressions in prayer, there's a way for us to be tedious in this. And the preacher, Solomon, he compares it to the fool's voice, which is often known for being full of uh, vain and flattering words, full of empty speech. And so th there's a danger here. And we're to be on guard here against, against multiplying uh, these these idle t uh, expressions in prayer. Now consider for a moment the difference when we see when we come to Luke 18. If we looked at Luke 18, the difference between the Pharisee's prayer and the publican's prayer in Christ's parable. The Pharisee came and he used many words, many expressions. Almost all of them were vain and, and arrogant and puffing himself up, focusing upon himself. But then look at the publican's prayer. Publican's prayer couldn't be more simple, couldn't be shorter. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Christ says, that was the prayer of faith. That was the prayer uh, that that man went down to his house, justified. To help us understand this, uh, I've got, I found this from, from Gill, and I'll quote Gill here. Anything and everything that comes up into the mind should not be uttered before God. Not anything rashly and hastily men should consider before they speak to the king of kings. For though set precomposed forms of prayer are not to be used, and we would affirm that, yet the matter of prayer should be thought of beforehand. What our wants are and what we should ask for whether for ourselves or others. And this rule, I fear, we often offend against, says, says Gill commenting here. And so there is a danger here of, of having a tongue running free and going into vanity and foolishness. Even though uh, the Lord has invited us to pray and, and, and called upon us and, and uh, opened up the door for us to pray, there's still this, this circumspection that we are to have and not just, just being too wordy in our prayers or, or perhaps using words simply to fill up silence or perhaps being uh, so quick to speak that we're not uh, listening, listening. And so this gets more into uh, the worship of God being ready to listen, Solomon encouraging us to be ready to listen. Here's a great example from God's word of someone who is, is putting this into practice, someone who is not quick to speak,
but someone who is very eager and ready to listen. It's uh, Cornelius in the book of Acts, Acts Acts chapter 10. And remember, he's been searching for the truth. He's been asking the Lord to reveal to him the truth about Christ. And he's praying that the Lord would grant him knowledge. And then note his disposition here in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all the things that are commanded thee of God. So note Cornelius' disposition. He's prayed. He's asked God to reveal these things unto him. The Lord has answered in in a marvelous way. And there's Peter. And so Cornelius says, we're present here. We're here before God. He acknowledges that it's in the presence of God, that this is going to be uh, something holy when he hears these things, when he hears this preaching from Peter. And he says, we're here and we're ready to hear all the things that are commanded of thee by God. It's time for him to hear. And so this is a great example of someone who is more ready to hear than to speak, eager to listen. And so there's a simple question for us this evening in light of this admonition about being more ready to hear than to speak. I'm talking about uh, something going on in, the, in, in sort of the, the inner person right now. Whose words are more predominant when we come before God? Whose words are more predominant in the, in the inner person? Whose words are bouncing around more in our heads when we come to worship the Lord, would they be God's words or our own words? Even tonight, I could, I could ask you, whose words are bouncing around in your head? Now, this is a struggle. Uh, children, I know that, that you struggle with this, and I know that young people struggle with this, and it's a struggle for everyone to turn down the noise of the words bouncing in our own heads and to give that due consideration and that weight to the Lord's words, to everything that God says, and to be attentive, as Cornelius was, to everything that God is commanding. It's a struggle. It's a struggle, but this is what it means when Solomon, he instructs and he says, be more ready to hear. Turning down that that voice that's bouncing around in our heads all the time. Uh, James would put it this way, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And so if this is good counsel, if what James has said is good counsel in in conferences, everyday conferences that we have with men, how much more is it it good counsel when, when we're in the conference of the Lord? When we enter into the house of God and we're in the conference of the Lord. And so Solomon, once again, is telling us to be slow in, in speaking and filling up uh, things with, with uh, multitudes of words. Be slow in speaking. Take your time. Even if it means spending some time in, in silence and some reflection, take your time. Form the words. Pray. And then also certainly be very ready to listen. And the great news here is that the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit to help us in prayer. Praise God for that, that we have the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we do not know how to pray, because we're going to get it wrong. But the Holy Spirit is promised to to take our prayers and to to express them in ways that we cannot to the Lord God. And this is is a great consolation for us. Praise God for this. Well, we've, we've talked about keeping our feet, keeping the foot when going to the house of the Lord. We've talked about being more ready to hear. 
We come to the third and the last admonition that we're going to take up from this passage, not offering the sacrifice of fools. Solomon, the preacher, he says, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. And so what we're to take from this, what Solomon is is conveying to us is this. Don't fall into the trap of the fool who thinks, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm here. I'm attending the Lord's worship. The Lord will surely accept me. I've come, I've come far enough. I've just checked off the boxes. I'm attending, I'm attending the worship. The fool hasn't paused, hasn't, hasn't acknowledged and recognized uh, their, their, uh, their state before the Lord and instead has just come half-heartedly and just come and expects the Lord to accept his person based upon this sort of half-hearted, hasty, uh, non-preparation for the worship of God. Now, this is the sacrifice of fools. This is what Solomon says is the sacrifice of fools, this half-hearted attempt. Now, we, we do have examples from the word of God to help us wrap our, our minds around this, this idea of offering the sacrifice of fools. One of the most famous uh, potentially one of the most famous is found in 1 Samuel 15. And we're, we're probably very familiar with this. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone in the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen and chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is rejected thee, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has has also rejected thee from being king. And so we're familiar with this account. Uh, Saul transgressing. Saul not obeying the word of the Lord through Samuel. And just modifying it. And justifying himself and making excuses for it. Even saying, yea, I I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. This is a perfect example of what Solomon would call the sacrifice of the fool. It was not for the Lord. It wasn't for the Lord what what Saul did. Uh, Samuel makes this clear. He says, it would have been better if you had obeyed the voice of the Lord. So Samuel exposing Saul, saying it was not for the Lord that you did these things. Yet Saul, he sticks to his story. Uh, He says that he obeyed the voice of the Lord, even though it had all been uh, his own improvisation. He just gone in his own way and done what he thought was good in his sight. It's just a a complete uh, sort of a half-hearted attempt to obey the Lord. And and in his own mind, in his own heart, he felt as if he had obeyed the Lord. You see, it is so much like the fool to have a high opinion of, of their own motivations, such that they could make excuses for themselves all day long when they have actually clearly overstepped the commandment of the Lord. The fool is more concerned with their own intentions their own idea of what, uh, what they think is right. And so there's this half-heartedness in the fool, and the Lord rejects it. The Lord will not have it. 
This is the sacrifice of the fool. We're not to uh, to come to God uh, thinking that that we can cut corners, thinking that uh, we can uh, take shortcuts, whether it be in, in preparation, whether it be in giving God, uh, engaging the Lord with our hearts when we're before Him in worship. It, it's 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 foolishness. Uh, hear, hear what the prophet Isaiah says about this. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my souls, my soul hateth. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Isaiah 1. And so the prophet getting at this principle of the people thinking that they're doing what is right, when in reality there's, there's, uh, there's a foolishness in it, there's a, a vanity in all of it because of ignoring uh, what, what's really at the heart here, uh, obedience to God. Uh, these passages, uh, ones like these, they highlight, again, the evil of giving the sacrifice of fools. Solomon says they consider not that they do great evil. Uh, Half-hearted worship is evil. We need to get that in our minds. Not engaging with the Lord is evil. We need to understand this as the Lord's people. Uh, This this goes right along with what what uh, Solomon is instructing when he says, it's better to make no vow at all than to vow and not pay. And so that's the the performance aspect of it. It's, it's, it goes hand in hand with this idea of engaging the Lord with our hearts. And so, so, you see, so you see, it's better to make no vow at all than to do this half-hearted thing, than to be like that son that says, yes, Father, I will go into the fields and I will work and does not do it. <coughs> see, we are not to try to bargain with the Lord and think that we can supply uh, maybe just a little obedience here, a little bit obedience there, a little faithfulness here, a little faithfulness there, and this will be enough that the Lord will leave us alone if we just give the minimum that he will withhold his judgment and that the Lord should somehow be grateful to us that we have such good intentions. This is all the way of the fool. Uh, Solomon expands upon this, Ecclesiastes 5 Starting in verse 4, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that, that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than thou shouldest vow and not pay. And suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice, and destroy the work of thine hands? And so you see the common theme here is... Uh, lack of dedication, being half-hearted in these things. We, can, we are not to give the sacrifice of fools. There's no faking it when it comes to these things. There's absolutely no faking it. I remember when I was first starting out in seminary, I had a challenging conversation with an elder who was also a lieutenant in the uh, police force. And he was telling me, as a, as a young seminary student, he was telling me that the ministry, like police work in the ministry, that there is no such thing as faking it. That you cannot, you cannot get away with faking it in the ministry that most people would, would see right through it. Uh, whenever you deal with people, you have to be honest. You have to... Uh, You have to be very real with them. You cannot just answer them what you think they want to hear. 
uh, and expect them to uh, trust you. They won't. They, they, they will see through it. And this will actually leave people very exasperated if this is what you do, if you try to, to fake things. Now, th- this counsel, I think it's, it's good and it, it's stuck with me. But I think about how much, uh, how true that is, that, that people will, will usually see through someone who's faking, who's just saying what someone else, uh, what they think someone else wants to hear. If it's true with men, how much more true is it with the Lord? We can't fake anything with the Lord. We can't hide anything from the Lord. And so the Lord will not accept our excuses. And the Lord will not be impressed with uh, mighty and high-sounding words from us, promises. Uh, yes, Lord, I, I, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to do that, and, and not performing. No, the test would be in the performance of our vows and in doing the will of God. As Christ will say one day on a great and, and a terrible day to those people who gave the sacrifice of fools... Christ will say, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So you see, once again, it's about the actual performance of these things. All of this would just uh, crush any idea that we have of, of faking it, of trying to offer a little bit of obedience here, a little bit of faithfulness there. And having the Lord accept that. We should put that idea right out of our heads. Well, we've dealt with these admonitions, three of them in this passage. And we'll move to a little application. But before that, what we haven't really tackled is the why that's supplied here in the passage. The, the, the overarching question of, of why we would keep our foot when we go to the house of God. We've talked about it a little bit. But there's something in this passage that speaks to it right here in verse two. It says, for God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. And so that's the why. That's the main why that's given in this passage. God is in heaven, thou upon the earth. The great distinction between the creator and the creature. This is the reason that we are to stop, prepare ourselves, as we've seen from uh, good examples to give thought to coming for the, before the Lord, to be more ready to hear. That is the why. God is in the heavens. The earth is his footstool. None can turn back his hand. And the fact that he has purchased the people uh, through the blood of Christ and has invited them to gather and to worship, them, and to worship him, this is all the more uh, motivation for us that, that we should be in awe of him. And that we should be full of that godly fear. As, as Solomon says here in verse 7. For in the multitude of dreams and many words. There are also diverse vanity, vanities. But fear thou God. Fear thou God. That's where it's, it's leading us to. In verse 7. That we would fear God in light of everything that he's done. And these uh, solemn uh, admonitions. And so here, here's some closing applications. When we pray or we enter into worship, whatever the time it be, let us not forget that it is to be exclusively to God, time set apart to God. And though it might be a struggle, though it might be hard, let us turn down whatever voices there are that are bouncing around in our head and let us devote that time exclusively to God to God as much as we are able. Now, this doesn't mean that we suddenly stop being human and stop dwelling in bodies of flesh. When we enter into the presence of God, we still have these bodies of flesh and there will still be distractions. But it means that our goal, our aim, should be that we give greatest attention to the things that are taking place, to what is happening happening in the worship of God being very ready to hear, being very eager to to hear and understand all the commandments that God has given. You see, the fact that we are so tempted to listen to that noise of our own voice in our head, whatever's going on in our heads, the the, the cares of the world, the fact that we're tempted to that uh, so much, that, that should honestly 
shake us, that should startle us, that we as believers are still tempted so much to that. And we still struggle with it so much. That, that alone should cause us to seek forgiveness and to repent and to ask God for help in these things. And so that's uh, one application. The, the sacrifice of fools. The sacrifice of fools is something we're to avoid. As we've said, we're not to make these, these sort of bargains to try to make these bargains with God about how much obedience we'll give him. We're to avoid this sacrifice of fools. Remember what we read earlier, Proverbs 21. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? And this is what we do when we are only halfway engaged in God's worship. When we only, uh, when, we, when we think that the Lord should accept us, even though we know we are holding back. Even though we know that we are uh, not in a right mind to worship God. And so the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? You see, you see, my friends, we're not to think of our times of worship as, as if they're like an escape from reality. As if we have our normal life and then we, we have worship and we have, to, we have to escape from our normal life. No, that's backwards. Our times of worship, they are the reality. Our times of worship is the truth. It is heightened reality when we come before God, when we pray, when we worship him. We are doing then what we were created to do. We are doing now, Lord willing, what we are created to do. Everything, when we enter into God's presence, everything is then as it should be. It's not some alien experience, not if we are in Christ. No, it's, it's true reality when we are, are in God's presence, when we've come in, in a right state, when we've prepared, when we are coming, pleading Christ's righteousness, desiring to commune with God, to fellowship with Christ. That's, how, that's when everything is as it should be. And that is reality at its most real. When we, when we are in the presence of God. And so, finally, there's an encouragement here. There's an encouragement. If the, Lord take, if the Lord tells us that he takes no pleasure in the sacrifices of fools, if he says that if any man draw back, that the Lord, he says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, then there's also another side of that coin. There's another side of that coin that we can be encouraged by knowing that the Lord does take pleasure and those that fear him. The Lord does take pleasure in those who have been given that wisdom, who come properly, rightly, that because of Christ, only because of Christ's gifts, the Lord does take pleasure in, in, in that individual. Psalm 147, 11, it says, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. And how wonderful is that? What encouragement that is. The other side of this coin from Ecclesiastes, uh, verse 5. The Lord is worthy. He is to be feared in the assembly of his people. Psalm 87. May the Lord bless his word to us.